hit the subscribe button or visit us at auau.auanet.org. Good morning and welcome to AUA's Common Dilemmas in Prostate Cancer Detection and Management webinar. We thank you for joining us. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. The AUA is accredited by ACCME and designates this internet live activity for a maximum of 1.5 AMA PRA Category 1 credits. Uh, course handouts from the presentations have been made available to you. Please visit AUA University to access the handouts. Uh, course evaluations are very important to us. The course evaluations and CME credit will be administered electronically on AUA University immediately following the webinar. As AUA continues to develop virtual education that meets your needs, we welcome your feedback regarding both the content and the format of this webinar. Uh, all persons in a position to control the content of an AUA educational activity are required to disclose any relevant financial relationships with any commercial interest. Please visit the AUA University to view faculty and education council disclosures. Coding advice given during the presentations are the opinion of the presenters and may not have been vetted through AUA for accuracy, so please verify accuracy prior to reporting on medical claims. We do need you to, to actively participate. Uh, we do ask that you submit questions for the faculty on the content of the webinar. You have a questions box on your control panel, so please use that to submit questions to us throughout the webinar. Uh, there will be a Q&A session at the end where we will uh, address some of those questions. The AUA also encourages you to get social. Uh, so please, uh, if you're enjoying this webinar, um, we uh, encourage you to uh, share your experiences um, uh, with the global urology community and please tag the AUA at AmeriUrological and use the hashtag AUAVirtualExp. And to, uh, as just a reminder, to access the course evaluation credit claim and uh, the certificate, uh, by visiting the AUA University, uh, there will be a keyword that, that will be provided at the end of this webinar that you can use to access those items. Uh, this, this educational series is supported by independent educational grants from Astellis, AstraZeneca, Bristol Myers Squibb, Genentech, Merck, Pfizer, and Sanofi Genzyme. And here is uh, where we will begin our uh, pre-session knowledge assessment. Dr. I would like to welcome our course director, Dr. Gerald Andrioli, who will be reading the uh, questions here. And um, I will be uh, providing a slide uh, following the reading of the questions for you to vote on the answers to the questions. So Dr. Yeah, Andrioli. Thank, uh, thank you and good morning. Uh, everyone. So here are our uh, baseline uh, questions. Uh, question number one, serum-based biomarkers associated with an increased risk of high-grade prostate cancer at the time of biopsy include A, PCA3, B, PSA, C, decipher, or D, the 4K score. Please key in your answers now. Sorry, we don't have any music. Uh, we'll get, looks like we've got about roughly 70% of you voting. We'll let it go another few seconds. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close this uh, this voting uh, slide and move on to the next question. Okay, question two. Which of the following patients are not likely to benefit from continued PSA screening? A, a 65-year-old Caucasian with moderate comorbidity. B, a 50-year-old African-American with no significant past medical history. C, a 65-year-old Caucasian, minimal comorbidity, 
brother with BRCA mutant diagnosed with high-risk prostate cancer at the age of 49, or D, a 74-year-old man with a serum PSA of 0.5? Okay, please vote now. Okay, a lot of very confident people for this question. I'm gonna go ahead and close this question and we'll go on to question three. Okay, question three. Which of the following statements is not true about transperineal biopsy of the prostate? A, a lower infection rate than a transrectal biopsy. B, better assessment of the anterior prostate than a transrectal biopsy. C, can rarely be performed under local anesthesia. D, can be done using a grid-based or a freehand approach. Okay, please vote now. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and close this question so most of you have voted. Okay, question. question number four. The most sensitive test to evaluate men with biochemical recurrence of prostate cancer after a radical prostatectomy appears to be A, a C11 choline PET scan, B, a C11 acetate PET scan, C, an F18, FACBC PET scan, or D, a gallium 68 PSMA PET scan? Please key in your answers now. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close this poll. Looks like most of you have voted. All right, uh, question number five. A 59 year old man is found to have Gleason 4 plus 5 with right seminal vesicle invasion, extensive extracapsular extension, and a focally positive margin at the time of a radical prostatectomy. His post-operative PSA is undetectable. You recommend A, serial PSA testing and salvage radiation therapy if warranted. B, adjuvant radiation therapy. C, adjuvant radiation therapy along with six months of androgen deprivation therapy. Or D, adjuvant radiation therapy and two years of androgen deprivation therapy. Okay, please key in your answers. Okay, just a few more seconds on this one. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and close this poll. Here's the last question. 
Yes, our final question uh, is approved therapeutic options for patients with non-metastatic castrate resistant prostate cancer include all of the following except A, apalutamide, B, darolutamide, C, enzalutamide, and D, olaparib. Okay, please key in your answers. Okay, I think that should do it for us. I'm going to close this last poll here and we'll complete the knowledge assessment. Thank you all for participating and I will turn it over here to Dr. Andreoli. Sarah, thank you uh, very much. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, to uh, be a participant uh, in this course uh, along with uh, our uh, very uh, distinguished faculty all of whom you know, need no uh, real introduction. Uh, Dr. D'Amico uh, is the professor of radiation oncology at Harvard Medical School and the chief of genitourinary radiation oncology at the Dana-Farber Cancer Center and the Brigham and Women's Hospital. Dr. Kaibel is professor and chief of urology at Harvard Medical School and uh, the Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. And Dr. Oliver Sarter is the Laborde Professor of Cancer Research, Medical Director of uh, at Tulane University uh, School of Medicine in New Orleans, and a well-known uh, hurricane dodger. Here are our um, learning direct, uh, objectives. And as you could tell from the six uh, pre-symposium uh, questions, we are really uh, assessing uh, the entire spectrum of prostate cancer from screening all the way through diagnosis and uh, to treatment uh, with uh, uh, systemic and uh, radiation therapeutic uh, options. Our agenda today is that we will proceed with these four 15-minute lectures. The first is the use of PSA in screening and prognosis along with the discussion of salvage and adjuvant radiation therapy by Dr. D'Amico. Dr. Keibel will then talk about novel biomarkers for prostate cancer. I will talk about uh, strategies to optimize prostate biopsy and an update on prostate imaging tests. And finally, Dr. Sartor will talk about the role of PSA and of new therapeutics uh, in treating men with advanced prostate cancer. Uh, we would encourage you to submit questions uh, during the uh, presentations and uh, at the conclusion of the uh, formal presentations uh, we will have a, a question and answer session uh, probably for the final uh, 15 minutes or so. So without uh, any uh, further ado I'd like to invite uh, Dr. D'Amico to kick us off. And as I said, he will be talking about PSA screening, hypofractionated uh, therapy, salvage, and adjuvant uh, treatments for prostate cancer. Thank you very much, Jerry. Uh, so I'd like to uh, cover a few topics with you today. All of them will be based on the results of prospective randomized trials, uh, many of which um, you're going to hear about probably for the first time because they were just presented in abstract form today. Just a quick, uh, very short little story to start. We have two uh, psychoanalysts walking by each other in a hallway after a meeting has ended. One of them looks over at the other, smiles and says hello. The other one smiles and walks on. The one who walked on after he gets far enough out of the way says to himself, hmm, I wonder what that smile was all about. All right. So we're going to start here with the learning objectives, uh, PSA for screening and whom, 
the level one evidence to guide adjuvant versus salvage radiation therapy. And this is where the abstracts have just been presented within the last nine months that we'll discuss. Uh, and these papers have not yet been published, but uh, expected to be published soon. And then the basis to the approach for a patient with high risk or oligometastatic, oligometastatic prostate cancer, which is a new topic uh, in the last year, which really has gained uh, some additional evidence to support. So in terms of screening, you've seen may perhaps this data before, but I think the key thing is there are three randomized screening trials, the US one, the PLCO, the European one, and the one that was out of the UK. Shown at the bottom, uh, what's important is that the PLCO screen people annually, ERSPEC screen people every four years for the most part, some in that some people in that study every two years, and the UK screen people just once. I think what's important to understand is that because of issues with either contamination where PSA was obtained, even though they were not randomized to that arm, or non-attendance where PSA was not obtained, even though they were supposed to, it turned out in the PLCO study, roughly the same percentage of people got a PSA in both arms. In ERSPEC, um, that was probably the biggest uh, difference in terms of screen, no screen. It was 64% in the screening arm, 15% in the no screen arm. And in the uh, UK study, that uh, difference was 36 versus 15%. What's relevant in terms of the results is shown here on the next slide. If you look across from left to right, You'll see in the European study where the difference in PSA screening was maximal of the three studies, about 50% difference in PSA screening between the two arms, that there was a split in the cancer-specific uh, mortality curve starting at about six to seven years. When you look over at the UK study where people were screened once, and there was about a 20% difference in screening between the two arms, the curves do split, but much, much later out beyond a decade. And in fact, since that split was so late in the course relative to the follow-up, the difference in the curves actually was not significant as it was in the European study. And finally, in the PLCO study, where essentially the same proportion of people got screened in both arms, we didn't see a significant difference in cancer-specific mortality. What you can take away from when you look at these three studies in, in, in conjugate, is that the more the difference in PSA screening is between the two arms, i.e., the better the assessment of the test, because ideally you'd want 100% screening or no screening at all, the more likely you were to see a difference that was significantly different in cancer-specific mortality. And so it does lend credence to the fact that PSA, when used properly, does work in reducing cancer-specific mortality. And so in terms of who should be screened, well, if we think about that there was a benefit seen in the European study six to seven years after randomization where people were screened every one to four years, uh, that probably people who are healthy, young, and average or high risk should be considered for screening. And the U.S. Preventative Task Force now says that you know we should have a discussion of PSA screening in these men who are typically starting at age 50 if they're at average risk. High risk, though, is different. People perhaps who are African-American, particularly those with family histories um, and first-degree relatives would be considered to be started earlier. Uh, earlier would mean usually 40. Um, and the other thing to know, too, is that the younger a man is, because they are less likely to harbor BPH, the PSA has better performance characteristics, as would be expected, because it's not confounded by BPH, assuming it's not confounded by bike rotting or ejaculation. And those are things that patients should be instructed not to do the week prior to a PSA test. So there's one additional point, which is sort of evidence from the last year or so. And that is, what about men um, who have uh, a first degree member, you know, in their family who've d developed prostate cancer at an early age, um, less than 60, particularly if it's high risk prostate cancer? These may have a genetic link, particularly BRCA1, BRCA2, and now people are discussing genetic testing in people when there's early onset high-risk prostate cancer in a first-degree family member. Looking now uh, just at this one slide I included, because it's a meta-analysis of about 6,000 men using this technique called stereotactic body radiation therapy to treat prostate cancer. 
And what you see uh, with relatively short median follow-up, about three and a quarter years, is that as you increase the dose of radiation given each day, and there's only five treatments delivered in, in this type of uh, approach, that in fact you improve cancer control, the PSA control goes up, but not unexpectedly, you also increase late GU toxicity, particularly bladder neck, urethral stricture, and radiation cystitis at the bladder neck. And this really is remarkable because it's only a median follow-up of three, a little over three years, and we know late GU toxicities uh, really peak seven to 10 years after treatment. And so it seems like there's a, a, a expedited you know, uh, occurrence of these events uh, because of the higher perhaps radiation dose in the shortened period of time. There are people now who are using some more sophisticated means like an MRI guided linear accelerator. We happen to have one in Boston uh, where you can actually see the urethra and the bladder neck and protect it. But if you just do this stereotactic body radiation therapy without some more sophisticated measure of urethral and bladder neck anatomy, what this is telling us is that you know these approaches with very high doses of radiation can injure those areas. Uh, and the higher the dose of the radiation, the sooner those injuries are seen and the more likely they are to occur. However, there is an increased cancer control, and so more work needs to be done in this area and is being done to actually localize the urethra, the bladder, neck, so you can take advantage of the cancer control without the late toxicity. Now, these are um, the only randomized data that looks at this, this very short radiation, extreme hypofractionation uh, approach versus standard approaches. This is a Swedish study. This was the first paper published in the uh, Lancet Oncology at a median now of five years. It does show non-inferiority between these two approaches. So the cancer control, if anything, you know, with the approach um, of a very short course or a standard, you know, eight, nine week course is likely the same, perhaps even a little bit better with the shorter course. But in this randomized study, there were significant worse acute urinary and bowel functions in the short arm and worse uh, late urinary symptoms after a year. And that's only after a median follow-up of five years. So again, the urinary issue is something we're particularly con uh, concerned about. So we do not recommend these very short courses of radiation off of a study. And until we can really identify urethra and bladder neck uh, using more sophisticated technologies, I wouldn't recommend doing uh, these approaches in the current uh, era. Now, oligometastatic disease has become uh, a big picture now and a big topic uh, in the current, uh, current workplace, particularly in prostate cancer, where we know, uh, or at least have suggestions, that minimal metastatic disease may have an advantage when providing uh, various systemic and local therapies. There were two randomized trials that asked the question of whether adding radiation to the prostate to standard of care approaches, that is in the metastatic setting, can prolong survival. And these two studies, the Harad and Stampede's results, are shown here on this next slide. The Harad study had approximately 400 men, the Stampede about five times that, 2,000 men, the median follow-ups were roughly four and three years, respectively. And the actual overall results in the all column that you see there showed no difference in survival when you looked at all comers. However, one thing that's not on this slide that's worth knowing is that in all comers, um, progression-free survival was improved with the addition of prostate radiation across the board. So that is level one evidence that if you treat the prostate in somebody with metastatic disease, irrespective of the metastatic burden, the number of metastatic sites, you'll delay time to progression. Now, what they went here and did a step further is what about men who have minimal metastatic disease? Just, you know, less than um, three, three or less mets was in the stampede, five or less in the harad. It suggested that there was a benefit in overall survival to treating the prostate, but not seen in people with more extensive metastatic disease. The only proviso here is that men were not stratified prior to randomization by metastatic burden. And so while these results are intriguing and suggest there may be a survival benefit to treating the prostate in men with minimal metastatic disease, they're not conclusive. Although we do offer this now because we have two studies that are suggesting about a 32% reduction in death um, with minimal metastatic disease. And so I think it's reasonable to offer this um, but maybe not uh, to say that there's definitely a survival benefit. 
So that's what I just said there. Now, what about this other data, the Sabre Comet trial, which was just updated this year? This is where you have a person who has a controlled primary, and now you treat the oligometastatic disease with high-dose radiation. There were 99 men in this study. 92% uh, of them had three or less oligomets. 16 had prostate cancer of the 99. And uh, this was a phase two study, which suggested, in fact, a survival benefit um, to doing this. Uh, as well as a progression-free survival benefit. There was some increased toxicities, but mostly in people who had lung cancer with brain metastases near base of skull, uh, excuse me, bone metastases near base of skull or near the mediastinum. Uh, but in the prostate cases with peripheral bone mets, uh, the adverse events were minimal, if any at all. But we also noted is that we took the 16 men without prostate cancer um, out of the, uh, the data set you still saw something that was close to a survival benefit uh, overall. So the prostate cancer group was driving that p-value of 006, the survival benefit that was seen. So there's a suggestion here from these phase two data that if you have somebody with minimal oligometastatic disease, perhaps treating the prostate and the oligomets, you know, with high dose radiation may afford a prolongation in survival. And the key word is may. And so that summary here is that if you have someone with minimal metastatic disease, no visceral metastases, it may make sense to treat the prostate and perhaps even the oligomets. We currently do this at our institution for men with minimum, minimal metastatic um, disease, but we're telling patients that we're not guaranteeing them that survival will be prolonged, but rather we know progression will be delayed and possibly there could be a benefit uh, in curability. The last uh, thing here in, in this topic is the Medicure study, which includes men as shown with high-risk disease or people um, you know, with nodal disease or minimal metastatic disease, where they give them neoadjuvants, sophisticated hormonal therapy, which you'll hear more about from Dr. Sartor. They treat the oligomets with this high-dose radiation I mentioned, and then they do a radical prostatectomy and a lymph node dissection. The primary endpoints are the, whether you have a pathologic complete or near-complete response at surgery, and whether or not you can get a PSA to undetectable levels with the normal testosterone. This is really to get tissue and to better understand the biology of what's going on in these particular men. The last topic is going, and there's uh, one question here that I'd like to chat with you about, which is, you know, in whom may treatment of the primary improve overall survival in men with newly diagnosed metastatic disease? And the correct answer is three, is B, three or fewer bone mets and no visceral mets as we just described. This last topic is about adjuvant versus salvage radiation. Here we have a 59-year-old man with high-grade Gleason 9 at prostatectomy. That Gleason 9 is confirmed. He has a positive margin with extra capsular extension, right seminal vesicle invasion, uh, and right ECE with an undetectable PSA postoperatively. The old studies suggested a halving of progression when you gave adjuvant radiation, but the issue was we didn't have PSA monitoring routinely back then, and salvage was late, and therefore we're not sure if these results um, are as robust, particularly the survival benefit that was seen in one of them, which was the earliest study where salvage was done late. So there are now randomized trials, radicals and raves, uh, UK and Australia, asking the questions, is adjuvant superior to salvage, and raves, is salvage not inferior to adjuvant? The bottom line is that the radicals trial did not show a difference, neither did raves, but something unusual happened in these studies, and that is we noticed that when they did the superiority tests, the hazard ratios were greater than one, which suggests that adjuvant could potentially be inferior to salvage, which doesn't make sense. At best, adjuvant could be equivalent if, or maybe better than salvage because it's given earlier, not later. And they did a meta-analysis and came up with the same conclusion. Again, hazard ratio is greater than one. And so how could this be? Well, it might be that you're giving salvage ADT and adjuvant ADT. And if you did, if you gave more salvage ADT than adjuvant ADT uh, in this, then you might be able you know, to make salvage look better than adjuvant. But in fact, if that happened, non-protocol use of ADT was counted as a failure in these studies. So that can't explain it. What does explain it, we believe, is something called immortal time bias. And there's a lot of words on this slide, but I'll summarize it in the following. After a man on the salvage arm hit a trigger PSA of 0.1 or 0.2, there was a period of two months they had to start radiation, two months to deliver it, and three months to assess response. 
That's about seven months of time. There are people like Gleason 8 to 10 and seminal vesicle invasion whose PSA will rise beyond the failure point of 0.4 in that seven month period, the people with very short doubling times. And, but they're not accessible during that time because they're still getting treatment or being assessed for treatment at that seven month time point. They could then get scored at a point later than on the adjuvant arm, making salvage look better than adjuvant because they get scored later than on the adjuvant arm because they're not accessible during the time while treatment is being delivered. This is called a mortal time bias, and it was seen in the RAVES trial where hazard ratios were 178 and 111 in SV invasion and Gleason 8 to 10, just the people you'd expect, short doubling times and the inadequate assessment, therefore. And so as a result, this is a picture of what I just said, the, uh, the, the arrow going up, that line going up is the PSA rising to 0.4, which is the failure point. But if the time needed to become eligible to observe PSA failure was longer than that on the salvage arm, you score them later than the adjuvant arm. And so coming back to this case of the man who has Gleason 9 with seminal vesicle invasion, the question is what to do? Should he get adjuvant or should he get salvage? Currently, we don't have proof that adjuvant is better than salvage, but these studies don't really address the question. There's this bias I just explained and less than 17% of the patients in these studies actually had those characteristics. So for the current time, probably all men can undergo salvage and not adjuvant, except those with high grade disease and or seminal vesicle invasion. More study is needed in those patients. That's my last slide. Um, I'd like to now uh, turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Keibel, who's gonna talk to you about novel diagnostic and prognostic tests. Thank you for that kind introduction, uh, uh, Anthony. Uh, very interesting, some of the ongoing work that's going in in salvage and adjuvant radiation therapy. I, I think it sort of drives home the point that the more we know, the more interesting things, uh, new questions we have to ask. So my, my job in the next 15 minutes is to evaluate novel and, uh, diagnostic and prog prognostic tests uh, for uh, patients who are being screened for prostate cancer. Thought I had control. There we go. So these are some of my disclosures. Uh, none of them are germane in any way to this uh, discussion. So these are some of the novel tests that are available to all of you in the clinic. Uh, I think the fact that there are so many tell us two things. Uh, number one, there's a clear need. We're dying for a, a new test that does a better job of determining who has prostate cancer and specifically who has aggressive prostate cancer. Also, the fact that there are so many tell us that none of them, not one of them, is actually perfect. So clearly our goal in patients that we're evaluating for whether they have aggressive prostate cancer is to identify men in need of a diagnosis, decrease the number of unneeded biopsies, and importantly, treatment, because the problem is biopsy often leads to diagnosis, often leads to treatment, but we still want to biopsy and treat those patients who are in need. And that's really what these novel tests are about. So just to drive that point home further, uh, in the past, if you wanted to screen a man, you basically had PSA. If you want to diagnose a man and determine how aggressive the cancer is, you had PSA. After treatment, you had one biomarker, that was PSA. And a patient who had metastatic disease and you're evaluating to see how aggressive the cancer was, you had PSA. So we're fortunate now in that we have multiple other additional therapies that can actually be used in each specific disease space. The ones that I'm gonna focus on today, because we only have 15 minutes, is those in the screening arena. So a little vignette, a 65-year-old male, presented with a PSA of 4.7, a very common occurrence. This was the first PSA ever checked. I think one of the uh, uh, things that's happened as a result of all the negative publicity around PSA is we're increasingly seeing older patients that are having a first PSA check. Fortunately, this gentleman's PSA was 4.7, but we see some patients where the PSA is 8, 9, 10, 42. I saw a patient the other day with a first PSA of 42. He's healthy, he's sexually active, he has absolutely no symptoms consistent with a urinary tract infection, recent instrumentation, he hasn't had sex recently, he doesn't ride a bike, and, but he still says to me, doc, the biopsies are painful, and I've read in the New York Times that treatment is bad, so can we skip it? 
So this is an old study about 20 years old, but I think the message is clear. And that is the first thing to do is repeat the PSA. So this was done by James Easton. And basically he looked at patients who had an elevated PSA either defined as greater than four or greater defi defined as greater than 2.5. And roughly a third of the patients would have a, a normal PSA if it was rechecked again. And importantly, if you rechecked patients multiple times, you'd find that in the future, an elevated PSA would return to normal almost 50% of the time. So the first thing to do is to wait a, a month or two and repeat the PSA. So we repeat the PSA three months later after refraining, as I said, from sexual activity and bike riding, et cetera. His PSA now is marginally elevated, 4.8. And he says, doc, is there any other tests we can get? I'm desperate to avoid getting a biopsy. So the goal of additional testing is to identify patients who can safely avoid a biopsy, and MRI and biomarkers are very useful in this space. Now, I'm not going to talk about MRI. Uh, Dr. Andrew is in the subsequent talk, but I think you have to think about the MRI as a biomarker as well. And this is really the algorithm. You have patients, you repeat the PSA. I cannot overemphasize that. Repeat the PSA. Then one very reasonable thing to do is to go ahead, get an MRI, and do a biopsy either way. There are plenty of patients out there that are nervous, that are apprehensive. There are patients where the risk is quite high. So a patient who's got a strong family history of prostate cancer, maybe he has BRCA2 mutations. I don't really care what the biomarker says. I think the patient's going to need a biopsy. So I'll get an MRI, and if the MRI is positive, I'll do a, a, a focal a focus biopsy, an image-guided biopsy, as well as 12-core biopsies. And if the risk is high enough, even if the MRI is negative, I will repeat the biopsy. I will do a biopsy. The second option is just to observe the patient, which I think, again, is very reasonable for a PSA this low. PSA it was 12 or 13. I think I'd be a little nervous about that. But at 4.7, 4.8, I feel it's pretty safe to follow the patient. Last one is biomarkers. Uh, which we're going to talk about, and the last is imaging, which Dr. Andrew is going to talk about. So I'm going to focus on the biomarker question. So the first, this is a urine-based biomarker. The next few I'm going to discuss are urine-based. PCA3 is a non-coding uh, mRNA, or I guess not an mRNA, it's an RNA found in the urine. Its expression is restricted to the prostate, and basically what you're looking at is the ratio of PCA3 to PSA, and a low value is good. A high value is, it demonstrates an increased risk of aggressive prostate cancer. And importantly, unlike PSA, PCA3 is independent of things like prostate volume, age, BPH, prostate, prostatitis, the kind of things that confound a PSA value. This is a study that I was fortunate enough to be involved in, uh, run by John Way, uh, roughly 1,000 men, some having an initial biopsy, some having a repeat biopsy, and roughly a third of the men had prostate cancer an 11 center trial. This is the initial biopsy data. Uh, and uh, basically what this uh, figure shows that if you break patients down into different groups of PSA, those with a low PSA, those with an intermediate PSA, and those with a high PSA. And then for each of these, you have a different PCA3 value. And what you can see is as the PCA3 value increases, you are more likely to have prostate cancer. Not that you necessarily have it or don't have it, but more likely to have it. And importantly, the black bar is the risk of having aggressive prostate cancer. So for somebody who has a score of greater than 60 and a PSA of greater than 10, you can see not only are they almost certain to have prostate cancer, notice I said almost certain, but they're also very likely to have Gleason 7 cancer or above. So this is FDA approved, correlates with the risk of prostate cancer, and importantly, aggressive prostate cancer. And presumably, you can spare men with a low PCA3 a biopsy. This is another XODX prostate, another urine-based marker. Exosomes are small fragments of cells that can be found in the urine and in the blood, actually. They look at a variety of different genes to see whether they are elevated in the exosomes. And in this study, a very similar as the prior study I, I, I outlined, they're looking not only for risk of prostate cancer, but risk of Gleason 7 and above. And we can see here in the yellow dash line is how PSA performs. Better than chance, but not great. And you can see that clearly the gene expression assay, the exome uh, DX does a better job. 
And the, if you had a threshold of 15.6, you could avoid about 20% of biopsies, and you'd miss only 2% of Gleason 7 and above, and you'd miss no tumors that had Gleason 4 plus 3. Which of those are the patients that you're most worried about missing? Select MDX is another urine-based marker. This is an attentive DRE, which is very similar to PCA3. That means you have to push very hard on the prostate. Again, a first catch urine sample. Uh, the mRNA your levels you're interested in are slightly different genes, but the same concept. These genes will be elevated in the urine. A very similar study design, uh, initial cohort, and then a validation cohort. And again, not only interested in the risk of having prostate cancer, but the risk of having Gleason 7 and higher. And again, a very similar story. This time, the comparator was not PSA, but the Prostate Cancer Prevention Trial Risk Calculator, which is a very useful tool to incorporate PCA, excuse me, uh, PSA and other risk factors. So it do, in general does do better than PSA. But you can see that this particular marker did a better job than even that improved risk calculator. Now we're on to serum-based markers. Those were all urine-based markers. These are serum-based markers. So the first is, uh, is uh, prostate health index. This incorporates not only PSA, but also free PSA and pro-PSA. A low value is good, meaning you are less likely to have prostate cancer. Higher value, more likely to have prostate cancer, and more likely to have aggressive disease. Again, very similar study, about 800 to 900 men, all who had no history of prostate cancer, all of whom had a normal rectal exam and a PSA in that two to 10 uh, nanogram per ml range. They found that 25% of the patients had prostate cancer and clearly an increased score was associated with an increased risk. So again, an important take home message, which is true for all these biomarkers, a higher score associated with a higher risk of prostate cancer, but by no means does it mean the patient has prostate cancer. A low score is associated with a lower risk of prostate cancer but by no means does it mean that there's no risk of disease. But if you accept that 25 uh, cutoff, you could avoid a biopsy in 25% of men. Importantly, it appears to be associated with aggressive disease. So this is again, another study, very similar patient population. And they again had initial cohort in which roughly uh, one in five men had Gleason 7 cancer above on biopsy. And then in a validation cohort, where it was almost a third had Gleason 7 cancer or above. And this is the take home slide, I think. In the primary cohort and in the validation cohort, if you had a phi score of less than 20, almost none of the patients had Gleason 7 cancer or greater. So again, if the, if the phi score is less than 20, you can be assured to a reasonable degree, 98% chance the patient doesn't have Gleason 7 or above, which is the disease that we care about. So it correlates with risk of cancer, correlates with risk of aggressive cancer, and the phi score patients, if they're low, could be spared a biopsy, and it's FDA approved in this space. Last one uh, I believe I'm going to talk about is the 4K score. This is, again, a similar panel of, of known markers. It's a blood test, a serum test. They did a study uh, using the PROTECT data to find an elevated PSA of greater than three. So this is not for patients that have normal PSAs. This is for patients who have slightly elevated PSAs. Uh, roughly a third had Gleason 7 to 10, and two-thirds had Gleason 6. They modeled it and then validated it. So this is if you a modeling if you biopsied 1,000 patients, okay? What you find if you used a threshold of 6% and their current modeling uses 7.5, not 6%, you'd be able to avoid a biopsy in almost 50% of the patients and you'd still identify the vast majority of patients at least in seven or above. So is it a perfect test? No, but clearly you're bending the axis towards identifying patients that have least in seven or above. One of the things I like about many of these tests, and I'm just highlighting this one, is they give reporting that actually is very easy for the patients to understand. So this is the 4K score. And what you can see is you can reassure a patient that has a low risk. There's a 95% that they don't chance they don't have aggressive prostate cancer. And there's a 99.8% chance that they're not gonna develop metastatic disease in the next 10 years, which is very reassuring to the patient. I think the graph also looks very nice here. You can go ahead and tell this patient he's in a low risk group. Now, importantly, it's a percentage. 
So there's never a yes, no answer. You're presenting a risk to the patient and people interpret risk differently. So this is not FDA approved. It does correlate with the risk of cancer. It correlates clearly with the risk of aggressiveness and it reports in a way that I find very easy to discuss with patients and allows you to define a patient population you shouldn't biopsy and a patient population that maybe you should. Uh, so this patient had an MRI, demonstrated no lesions. His 4K score is quite high at 34%. A biopsy is performed, even though the MRI was negative, and it's benign. And now the patient is worried because he saw this 34%. He said, doc, is there some test to see if you missed it? And that's where confirm MDX comes in. This is for patients who have an elevated PSA and a prior negative biopsy. And in the prior biopsy core, they're analyzing several different genes to see where these genes are associated, uh, to whether these genes are elevated or methylated, excuse me, not elevated or methylated, and that methylation is associated with an increased risk of subsequent cancer. So this is the first study looking at roughly 500 patients. Again, they analyzed the first biopsy. And what they found is that the scored as positive, it had a sensitivity of 68%, a specificity of 90, of, excuse me, of 64%, a negative predictive value of 90%, and a positive predictive value of 29%. So as you can see, this is the one that jumps out, the negative predictive value of 90%. So what this tells you, if there's no methylation of these genes, there's a 90% chance that on a subsequent core, they wouldn't have cancer. And, it, and it's got a fairly robust uh, uh, odds ratio of 3.17. So it was validated in a second study, clearly correlates with the risk of cancer. There's really no data on aggressiveness that I know of, and it's a rationale for not repeating the biopsy. And it may, and I wanna emphasize may, give you information on where to repeat the biopsy. Those studies are ongoing, where there's methylation in the right you know, apex, that's the place where you want to direct your subsequent biopsies. So in conclusion, PSA testing is clearly flawed. I don't think I'm telling you something that you don't know already. Uh, it's a much better test, I think, than people give it credit for. Uh, and, and I personally am a strong proponent of PSA uh, testing, but clearly it's not perfect. In general, risk assessment is flawed, and that's why we need these biomarkers. And uh, biomarking testing focuses on identifying men, not just with prostate cancer, but men with potentially lethal prostate cancer. That's who we care about. Don't order too many tests. I see way too many patients who come in, they've had a five score, a 4K score, a PCA3, they've had five PSAs and two different MRIs, and they're asking me to try and interpret it. The problem is these tests won't all be positive, won't all be negative, and it can be very confusing to both you and the patient. So I'd stick with one that you like, maybe an MRI and one of the serum or urine-based tests, and that's what you use, and that's what you stick with. Thank you very much. I'd like to uh, introduce my uh, friend and colleague, uh, Jerry uh, Andrill, the, the uh, Robert Royce Distinguished Professor and Chief of Urology uh, at uh, uh, the Washington University School of Medicine, uh, who's going to spend some time talking about optimizing prostate cancer detection with a focus on uh, MRI and improved trust techniques. Adam, uh, thank you very much. Uh, really enjoyed uh, your and uh, Dr. D'Amico's talks. Uh, here are uh, my uh, relevant disclosures. Uh, the modern era of ultrasound guided biopsy started uh, in the late uh, 1980s. And, and just uh, from a historical perspective, when we started our PSA screening program, we did quadrant biopsies. Shortly after that, uh, Hodge reported a sextant biopsy, and, and that became the gold standard. Uh, but after uh, 30 years of doing uh, these ultrasound-guided uh, biopsies, we, now, we still don't really know what the optimum number of cores is. We do know it's operator-dependent, that no matter how good uh, we think we are, the cores are randomly arrayed that a negative conventional prostate biopsy requires a repeat uh, biopsy, and that even if you find cancer on one of these biopsies, uh, it's apt to either underestimate or really overestimate the amount of cancer in the prostate. Now, the first uh, technique to maybe improve this was to do a template-guided prostate mapping biopsy, which was done transperineally patient in the lithotomy position, uh, using a stepper and a grid as you might for brachytherapy, uh, 
generally I perform this only under sedation, although there are some proponents out there who are capable of doing it under local anesthesia in the office. I'm just not that uh, patient. I'm sure everyone in the audience has seen these grid uh, overlays that allow you to space your biopsies uh, every five millimeters. And depending on the length of the uh, prostate at a given uh, grid uh, aperture, you may need to take two cores uh, at that site, one proximal and one uh, more uh, distal. The uh, treatment uh, or the biopsy can be monitored very carefully uh, under uh, real-time ultrasonography. And there's no doubt, this is a summation of the uh, transperineal series out there, that if you do this kind of biopsy, you'll have a high chance of detecting prostate cancer just because of the significant core density. The problem with it, in addition to its difficulty to be done under local anesthesia, is that it does have a fair amount of side effects, including bleeding, uh, urinary retention, uh, but not sepsis. And, and a lot of these side effects occur because to do a, a template-guided transperineal biopsy of the prostate, you're generally taking 1.2 cores for each gram of prostate tissue. So you can see that you can quickly add up to a significant number of uh, cores uh, per uh, prostate, and therefore these complication rates would uh, commensurately rise. But if you're patient and you do it well, you know, you can really ascertain where that cancer is and really ascertain the true Gleason score of that cancer. And there are quite a large number of studies uh, done uh, that have shown that. And, and I just scrolled through them, but notice that all of them were done about 10 years ago in the pre-MRI and in the pre-prostate uh, imaging era. So some of these are really only now of uh, historical uh, interest. The only developments that are underway in this uh, regard are better biopsy needles. The biopsy needles that when you would uh, uh, push uh, the uh, trocar through the tissue will not uh, 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 vary uh, from uh, the direct uh, path of the needle. There will be no uh, deflection. And furthermore, there are needles now available that can take a six centimeter core. So that would obviate the need to take multiple biopsies through a given grid uh, aperture. Uh, there are now uh, more recently proponents of a freehand uh, transperineal biopsy of the prostate. Using this introducer needle through the perineum, you really only need to make two punctures uh, in the skin. And this uh, type of biopsy is not uh, quite as uh, template uh, guided as uh, the grid biopsy is. Uh, but because there's only the two apertures in the perineum, it actually is more feasibly done under uh, local anesthesia. You can see some graphics of it here. Uh, we have been using it uh, for the last few years. Uh, if uh, a patient uh, did not have an MRI, and we did this kind of biopsy, we found cancer about 60% of the time and about half of those cancers were clinically significant. If a man had an MRI that was not suspicious, and uh, like Dr. Keibel, I'm a proponent of doing biopsies nonetheless, we found cancer in 46% of the patients, but a smaller proportion of them uh, were uh, clinically uh, significant. But now I think we really do need to do image-guided prostate biopsy, and there are two basic ways. One is the exact view micro ultrasound, and the other is to use MRI-guided uh, biopsy. This is a 29 megahertz micro ultrasound device. The conventional ultrasound that, uh, device that we've been using is about seven megahertz. This allows much improved resolution. Here is a patient who previously had a sextant biopsy and a year or so later, you can actually see the biopsy tracks within the prostate. Uh, you can see uh, abnormalities within the prostate. Often a conventional ultrasound shows the prostate to be very homogeneous. There is a primus classification similar to the PIRATS classification where there are actually five 
Primus states. Primus 3, 4, and 5 are the ones worrisome enough for cancer. And with a little bit of practice, uh, you can generally, uh, as, the rate, as the urologist in real time, you know, classify the patient as having a significant uh, ultrasonic abnormality within the prostate. Uh, there are accumulating case reports uh, using this. Uh, Lori Klotz uh, presented uh, last year a 96% negative predictive value for uh, Gleason grade group two and above, 63% positive predictive value and a very high sensitivity overall. A number of uh, other series uh, from uh, Europe uh, for the most part. Uh, there was a comparative trial where micro ultrasound found as many clinically significant cancers as MRI did. Obviously, that's a great uh, cost savings and it keeps control of prostate diagnosis among urologists rather than uh, radiologists. But literally uh, a month or so ago in the Journal of Urology, it was the first well done randomized trial of a robotic fusion biopsy, in this case using the Artemis. Uh, platform compared to the micro ultrasound biopsy. And you can see that in the identified targets, there was a statistically significant higher detection rate in the micro ultrasound biopsy group. And you can see that in the light blue bar graph here. Patients also underwent uh, systematic uh, biopsies in addition to the targeted biopsies. And you can see that they yielded a similar proportion of significant cancers. When you put both the systematic and the targeted biopsies together, there was numerically more cancers found in the micro ultrasound group, but it was no longer statistically significant as it had been in the targeted group uh, only. So I've been using this uh, now for the last six or eight months. It can be done under local, uh, either transrectally or uh, transperineally. And I think that uh, we're going to find an emerging uh, benefit uh, to this uh, technique. The gold standard for now, I think it remains uh, MRI. I'm sure we're all familiar with the high probability of finding clinically significant cancer if the patient has a PIRADS-5 lesion. Uh, if the, the uh, radiologist classifies the lesion as only a PIRADS-3, only 12% of the time, is that, is that abnormality a clinically significant cancer? And your PIRAD fours are uh, in between in terms of the probability of a clinically relevant cancer. Lots of studies out there on MRI targeted biopsy. If you believed you would only biopsy a target in a biopsy naive man, you would, you would only biopsy 75% of the patients with an elevated PSA. Uh, if you only biopsy the lesion, obviously you would take fewer biopsy cores per biopsy session. You would find more cases of clinically significant cancer, fewer cases of clinically insignificant cancer, and you would have a more favorable 30-day patient reported outcome profile. But there are a lot of data out there now, and I'll just show a few studies showing that overall detection of clinically significant prostate cancer is improved by combining targeted and systematic approaches. A number of studies uh, out there. The other uh, important observation is that although these targeted biopsies are most easily done under fusion, that is not necessary. In experienced hands, a cognitively targeted biopsy of the prostate performed just as well as a fusion biopsy. And it also, the, these two modalities perform just as well as an in-bore MRI targeted biopsy. So it does, you don't necessarily need to invest in a fusion platform if you want to perform MRI targeted biopsies. The EAU has upgraded or updated uh, their uh, recommendations and uh, for biopsy naive patients if the MRI is positive they recommend with strong evidence combining a targeted and a systematic biopsy. Uh, the evidence uh, 
uh, for uh, systematic biopsy is a little less strong, as you can see below, for patients who had a prior negative biopsy. The NCCN 2020 update uh, takes sort of a similar stance by saying a negative MRI does not exclude the possibility of cancer, that you should consider biomarkers, as Dr. Keibel discussed, and or PSA density when deciding whether to uh, avoid or perform a biopsy in a man with a negative uh, multiparametric MRI. Now, a problem with MRI is that it's very difficult to get radiologists to agree. This is a study from Stanford where there were nine radiologists who were considered experienced in interpreting MRIs. And you can see that the distribution of their classification of those MRIs, even in a center of excellence, where the type of MRI image acquisition was uh, of high quality and homogeneous, varied uh, quite a bit. And just back to this uh, point about using MRI-defined prostate volume to calculate a PSA density. That is a very powerful tool. And so we have developed a calculator online using uh, data from our uh, in-house uh, MRI uh, experience. And I'll tell you, one of the main drivers of whether you ought to perform a biopsy in a man is his MRI calculated PSA uh, density. Now, high uh, intensity ultrasound and MRI are not the end of the story. Uh, there are going to be, and there already are, some investigations using PET scans along with MRI and along with uh, uh, CT scans to uh, identify prostate cancers within the prostate. These are not ready for prime time, but they're out there. And I would encourage um, everybody to just uh, keep an eye on uh, that experience. And that kind of brings me to the last uh, portion of my presentation, which is about the role of PET scanning in uh, men with prostate cancer. For most urologists, uh, the scenario where we will use this is men who have biochemical recurrence after either a radical prostatectomy or radiation therapy. The two recommended PET scans now are C11 choline, and F18 flucyclovine, also known as uh, FACVC or the Axumen scan. Uh, flucyclovine uh, is probably more sensitive than uh, choline, but an up and coming uh, PET scans include uh, gallium PSMA, and this is an in progress discussion that's taking place in the uh, current uh, version of the NCCN guidelines. But that's not the end of the story for PSMA PET scans. In this review article, in addition to the gallium PSMA for which there, most of our data comes, there are these three other fluorinated PSMA PET scans that have different routes of excretion and different uh, imaging characteristics that may make them relatively better than gallium PSMA to detect things like local recurrence versus uh, distant metastases. If we were to sum up PET scans for biochemically recurrent patients, the detection rate is dependent on the PSA level, FACVC more sensitive than choline, and particularly it's better for local recurrences in the prostate bed or within the prostate. PSMA-based scans are not approved in the US, but they are probably more sensitive than FACVC for non-local recurrent sites. And that's especially true for gallium, which is excreted in the urine. And so you can't really tell sometimes if there is a local recurrence versus just excretion of the agent. But the fluorinated ones may not have that problem. There's no doubt that the results of PET scans uh, change treatment decisions, but actually we really don't know if it's changing them in a meaningful uh, direction. Uh, the other thing is that uh, PET scans uh, using PSMA may not be, uh, you know, the only PET scan that we need to do uh, on patients who have biochemical recurrence, and that's because uh, recurrent prostate cancers are often very heterogeneous. PSMA expression may be upregulated in some, but not 
all uh, prostate cancers, and here's some of the basic science uh, behind that. Uh, and a very important consideration, uh, if you've been following the literature on theranostics and like linking an alpha or a beta emitting uh, particle to a PSMA study as a treatment for prostate cancer, this may not work because in studies that have been done, virtually every patient's metastasis had some cancer cells that were more than two millimeters away from a PSMA expressing cancer cell. So it would be very unlikely that uh, some of these emitting particles would have uh, been able to uh, treat that, uh, that uh, 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 clone of cancer cells. Uh, this is a typical uh, patient in whom I've been using uh, FACBC PET scans, a man in whom I had done a radical prostatectomy, he had some adverse pathological findings. Five years later, his PSA rose. We did a PET scan and found a single abnormal lymph node deep in the pelvis. Uh, we removed that uh, lymph node and found one of the six nodes was positive. His PSA may subsequently became undetectable and it's remained that way. The question is how long will it remain that way? Some of the early studies on this type of metastasis-directed therapy, and I know Dr. D'Amico alluded to them, showed that there was a higher uh, cancer-specific mortality in patients who received standard of care treatment in comparison that patients who received in the blue lines metastasis-directed therapy. This was published uh, three or four years ago. However, maybe that was uh, overly optimistic, just published last uh, month in uh, European uh, urology, uh, long-term outcomes of salvage lymph node dissections for nodal recurrence after radical prostatectomy, I'll just read the title, not as good as previously thought. And you can see the pretty rapid follow-up uh, in terms of biochemical recurrence and in terms of the need for uh, androgen uh, deprivation therapy. And the final topic I want to address is the use of PSMA scan uh, scans to uh, stage patients with newly diagnosed prostate cancer. This was a study of over 1,200 men who had intermediate or high-risk prostate cancer. And you can see they all had negative conventional imaging, but 8% of patients with a PSA of less than 10, 15% in the 10 to 20, and 40% of the patients whose PSAs were over 20 had distant metastases uh, if a gallium PSMA scan was obtained. Recently, uh, last month in Lancet was a randomized trial of uh, conventional imaging, CAT scan, bone scan versus PSMA PET scan. And I'll cut to the chase here. Uh, much higher detection rate for any form of metastatic disease, whether it was nodal disease or uh, distant metastases uh, in the bone. So I think this will be coming as a uh, necessary staging test for men with intermediate and high-risk uh, prostate cancer. And finally, I'll call your attention to this very last bullet in this uh, PSMA review article. Uh, PSMA PET is being studied in other malignancies. It may have a role, and underline the word may, uh, in patients with metastatic renal cell carcinoma uh, so keep, uh, keep that uh, back uh, in mind. So in summary, I would say that current ultrasound techniques need improvement, that uh, totally random biopsies should be avoided, uh, that transperineal approaches seem to be better than transrectal approaches in characterizing the location and the Gleason score. Uh, targeted biopsy with uh, micro ultrasound uh, and or uh, MRI uh, improves biopsy, but they're imperfect and you still need to do systematic cores in addition to your targeted cores. And uh, PET scanning with uh, CT or MRI seems to hold promise for staging patients, restaging patients, and even possibly for uh, primary uh, diagnosis of uh, prostate cancer. So thank you very much, and I'd like to turn it over now uh, to uh, Dr. Oliver Sartor, the Labordet Professor of Cancer Research.
and medical director of the Tulane Cancer Center. Thanks very much, Oliver. All right. Well, thank you, Jerry. It's really a pleasure to be here. You've got a great faculty, and I'm honored to be part of it. <clears throat> We've got a, a interesting little talk that I think will move into the advanced disease set up for my portion here. Is that predicted biomarkers and targeted therapies? And there's been so much that is coming down the pike. I'm going to give you a quick overview. I've got a fair amount of material, but I really want to introduce you to some concepts. Um, I do have some. Um, let's see, let's get, get it to advance here. Um, all right, having a little trouble with the slide advance. Um, there we go. Um, I do have some some potential complex. I've, I've worked pretty extensively in advanced prostate cancer for a long time. I, I certainly don't think anything that I say here will be influenced by these particular conflicts. I'm going to start off by talking a little bit about the molecular alterations in castrate resistant disease. And there are a wide variety of them. I'm going to start off by talking about the androgen receptor, or AR. And that's altered about 62% of the time, which gives us an important target. I think everybody knows about androgen receptor targeted therapy. We've got abiraterone, enzalutamide, apalutamide, darolutamide. All of these are winners, and it appears that when you give them a little bit earlier, that you get uh, a, a lot of a lot of activity. That's true for the for the hormone sensitive disease, and possibly even for earlier stage. But clinical trials are ongoing there. It also turns out that combinations are not so attractive to date, uh, but, but that's uh, going to be explored a little bit further. What we're thinking about, and this is really changing the way we look at castrate-resistant prostate cancer, is that when you give these newer androgen access inhibitors, something like abiraterone up front, that you really change the downstream effects. And this castrate-resistant disease is totally different today than what it used to be. I might add, just watch the AR degraders, antigen receptor degraders, those might be interesting. I'm gonna introduce you to high-dose testosterone a little bit, and really, uh, the key work is being done at, at Johns Hopkins. This is a little bit crazy. I call it turn the world upside down. Uh, there's a trial called the Transformer Trial. Uh, Sam Dinmead presented this at ASCO this year. And basically, it was taking people who had progression on abiraterone and randomizing them to high-dose testosterone or enzalutamide, and then looking at clinical and radiographic progression. And what he showed was quite interesting, that the response rate, at least as measured by PSA, was pretty much the same between enzalutamide and what he calls bipolar androgen therapy, which is 400 milligrams of testosterone sapionate. Now, that was quite a surprise, I think, to a lot of people. But one thing that was interesting, and I'll point this out, hopefully you can see that pointer, is that if you went to the high-dose testosterone and then followed that with enzalutamide, you turned out with a 78% response rate. So there might even be a rationale for abiraterone to high-dose testosterone to enzalutamide as a sequence, and we really need to have more data. This is preliminary data. I'm trying to be provocative here. I'm not really sure it's ready for prime time, but I am trying to be provocative and introduce you to new concepts. This is um, one that we published uh, actually back in 2016. It's quite interesting. We could follow the molecular changes. Here's an AR amplification. Uh, it was amplified about 16-fold. We started the high-dose testosterone, also had P53 mutations. We eliminate those alterations in the circulating tumor DNA. Here's the PSA going down, and then we flip-flop uh, between abiraterone and high-dose T, and you can see that we could get repetitive responses. Here, here we're looking at the circulating tumor DNA over time. Bottom line is, in terms of predictive biomarkers, we're going to be looking at circulating tumor DNA. We're going to be thinking about high-dose testosterone in all new ways. What other potentially druggable targets are there than the antigen receptor? Well, first of all, we're going to have the DNA repair genes. And now we have FDA approvals for the PARP inhibitors. We're talking about the mismatch repair genes. These are MSH2, MSH6, et cetera, and possibly CDK12. And there's activity for PD1 and anti-PDL1. 
Uh, these are the things like pembrolizumab, atezolizumab that you've been reading about for so many other cancers. We also have activity now in P10 loss and PSMA targeted radiopharmaceuticals, which I'll touch on briefly. When we look at DNA repair defects, approximately 20% of these advanced metastatic CRPC patients will have these, and the most common is actually BRCA. Now, if we look at the data to date, it's predominantly arranged around the PARP inhibitors, but I'm going to introduce very briefly ATR inhibitors because this is another area that we're starting to focus on. The big study here is the profound trial, a phase three elaborative trial, which is a PARP inhibitor. And basically what this did was take patients who had progressed after either abiraterone or enzalutamide or a taxane uh, as well, and then randomized them to receive either a laparib or a physician's choice. And physician's choice this time would be either abiraterone or enzalutamide as a second line therapy. And there were two cohorts, a cohort A, which looked at BRCA1, BRCA2, and ATM, and then cohort B, which was other ones. The primary endpoint was radiographic progression-free survival. And as you can see here, there, there was a, a strong improvement in radiographic progression-free survival in cohort A for those randomized to receive the elaparib. Has a ratio of 0.34, which in our world is quite strong. The confirmed response rate for those with measurable disease was about 33%. And if you look by gene by gene analysis, you can particularly see that BRCA2 patients seem to benefit. There were small subsets with RAD51B and RAD54L that also seemed to benefit, uh, whereas things like ATM, there really did not appear to be much benefit. There's another trial, and this is with Caparev with a PARP inhibitor called the Triton2 trial, similar in design. And basically what they did is look at the response rates, both radiographically and PSA, and you can see a number of these patients responded. This, there's no control group here, so this is just straight off response rate for the recaparib. And these data impressed the, the FDA. The recaparib got an accelerated approval on May 15th for BRCA1, BRCA2 mutations, both germline and somatic. And it, the patients here had to progress with both an antigen axis targeted agent and a taxane. And the elaparib got a relatively broad approval for a wide number of genes, a little bit debatable if all these should have been approved. But nevertheless, uh, there was progression after abiraterone or enzalutamide. So here you have genetic testing really begin to play a role as a predictive biomarker for this group of agents. Now, a variety of genes, there's differential sensitivity. I'll just say we have a whole lot of more work to do. This PAL-B2 does appear to be a gene that's active, uh, but again, we need more data. There are ongoing PARP monotherapy trials uh, out there. Uh, there's one with Rucaparib called the Triton-3 trial and the Talpro trial uh, that are being evaluated. But what has got some people excited is looking at a combination of PARP inhibitor and AR pathway inhibition. And there's some basic science rationale for this. And there's a trial published by Noel Clark. And when he looked at all patients, so these are not necessarily mutant patients, these are all patients, and using a combination of elaparib and abiraterone, and it looked like it could be promising. There are now a large number of trials, three trials, that are looking at these combinations with a PARP inhibitor plus abiraterone, PARP inhibitor, abiraterone, PARP inhibitor plus enzalutamide. So these trials are all ongoing right now. None of them have reported as of yet. Just want to mention ATM, which is relatively refractory to the PARP inhibitors, may be sensitive to ATR inhibition. There's new data here. We're going to keep an eye on this one. We also need to talk about P10 loss. This is about 40% of patients, and thus far it's not really been targetable, but there is a randomized phase two study with a pedicertib, which is an AKT inhibitor, and it turns out that a pedicertib does seem to have activity in P10 loss. And on June 18th, there was a press release about the pedicertib phase three saying that it met its co-primary endpoint, 
uh, progression-free survival in patients with P10 loss. So we need to watch this. Perhaps we'll see something in ESMO, I'm not for sure. But nevertheless, we may need to watch these P10 loss tumors because we may have a biomarker there as well. One of the things that we've found is that a subgroup of patients, just a couple of percent, will have high mutation load or mismatch repair alterations. And it turns out that these are biomarkers for program death one inhibition. This is the pembrolizumab um, and other such agents. I mentioned pembrolizumab very specifically because it is now FDA approved for those that are mismatch repair deficient or have a high tumor mutational burden or have a high MSI. There are a few other biomarkers out there, but they're pretty rare. But there is a little bit of activity here with CDK12, and that's something we need to watch for in the future. We've done some initial publications there. Now, targeted radiation, to me, is very attractive. Radiation will kill virtually all the mutations if the radiation reaches the tumor. Uh, there's mentioned earlier about the heterogeneity that can be present, and that's something we still need to work through. Nevertheless, PSMA being a transmembrane protein is highly upregulated in prostate cancer, and it's highly prostate-specific, not completely prostate-specific. When we look at these small ligands, the PSMA 617 is one that has a lot of attention, but also watch out for the PSMA INT. The PSMA 11 is primarily a diagnostic agent. These have the ability, this theranostic approach, to be really disruptive. And we've completed, I shouldn't say we, because I did not participate in this, therapy, which is randomized phase two trial, and then we have been involved with a phase three trial. Patients are selected in this particular trial called the therapy trial by looking at PSMA positivity and FDG, either negative, are FTG concordant. There's a subset of patients who are PSMA negative and FTG positive, and these patients have a very poor prognosis and really do not respond to much of any of the targeted radio pharmaceuticals. Here, there's a randomized study to look at the lutetium versus cabazitaxel, and it turns out that the endpoint here of a greater than 50% PSA response was substantially higher in those receiving the targeted radio pharmaceutical 66% versus chemotherapy at 37%. So this is pretty interesting from a variety of perspectives. There's a phase three trial that has now completed accrual. It's called the VISION trial. And this will probably be reporting at the end of this year, the beginning of next year sometime, although that's an event driven. I can't promise exactly when it will report. And this is a very important trial. So phase three data, if it's positive, we'll get an FDA approval out of it. If it's not positive, well, we won't. Our alpha particles better than beta. And there's some very interesting data with regard to alpha, such as actinium-225, a very dramatic uh, responding patient here, uh, 2,923 on the PSA going to undetectable. And this is a patient who had previously received things like docetaxel, abiraterone, insulutamide, radium, and more. So this is something we need to watch out for. And there, there are lots of things that are being developed now. So in summary, I'm just going to mention that high-dose testosterone is interesting and targets our old friend, the androgen receptor. Watch it. PARP inhibitors are very interesting. And now we have FDA approvals for two agents, particularly those re homologous recombination repair, particularly BRCA. Apatosertib is interesting for those with P10 deletion. Immunotherapy with PD-1 inhibitors is important in selected subsets such as high tumor mutational burden or mismatch repair. And these PSMA targeted radio pharmaceuticals may be here soon. We're looking forward to them hopefully being present next year. All right, that wraps it up. Turn it over to Q&A. Back to you, Jerry. Th uh, thanks very much. Uh... Oliver, and uh, thanks to all uh, who uh, submitted uh, some uh, questions. Uh, is Dr. Kabel, he's, he's alive now. Uh, Adam, I think there's a couple that uh, are meant for you. Uh, the first one, if a patient had a negative biopsy, but his PSA rises, it's over 10, you do a PCA3 test and it's very positive, 
would you perform a radical treatment without repeating the biopsy? A absolutely, right? Can you hear me? Yes, absolutely not. So th what you're saying is the patient does not have a pathologic diagnosis of prostate cancer, correct, from that question? Yes. Yeah. I don't think you can, in this day and age, you cannot uh, remove someone's prostate uh, on the basis of a, of a test like a PCA3. Remember, even at the highest value, there was about a, a uh, you know, it, it, it wasn't 100%. It was close to 100%, but it wasn't 100%. And so I think you need to go ahead and do a biopsy and prove that the patient actually has uh, prostate cancer that's significant. I would get an MRI beforehand. I would make sure it's a high quality three Tesla MRI read by a very good radi 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 radiologist. And uh, then I might do, that's one of the times I might do an inbore biopsy in order to best understand what's going, what's going on. Yeah, I mean, I, I think your comment about the MRI is spot on. You know, getting the MRI, even if it's a PIRAD 5 lesion, and even if the radiologist says, gee, it's seminal vesicle invasion, this, that, and the other, you still need a biopsy. I don't think we're at a uh, state yet where on the basis of imaging, like we would for renal cell cancer, for example, take out the prostate. I don't know, Anthony or Oliver, if you guys have any opinions on that. I do know Agreed. that I do know that people change management. Like that study you showed, Jerry, in the Lancet from May of this year, based on PET scanning, people, you know, saw metastatic disease and changed management based on that. Uh, but they did have biopsy proven prostate cancer to begin with. So that's maybe a different situation. But no, uh, for someone without a biopsy proven diagnosis, I really don't think you can act uh, and you shouldn't. As Adam says, nothing has 100% positive predictive value in terms of biomarkers and imaging. And, and I would say, it, I, it's all anecdote, but I had a patient this week where a radiologist said there was seminal vesicle invasion, a good radiologist. I showed it to another radiologist and they said, no, no, I think that's just blood. And they were both good. I mean, it's an impression what the, the, the MRI shows. And even good people have differences of opinion. That's why pathology is there to ensure, uh, quantify uh, how accurate they are. Adam, there is another uh, biomarker question. And since we have you going, uh, do you uh, recommend a repeat 4K score year to year or every few years? Uh, does it change? I, I think it's a great question, which I don't know the answer to. I, I, I'm curious what your opinion is. I have had patients that I've had repetitive 4K scores on. Uh, I, I find that's mostly patients who don't want to undergo a biopsy, and no matter how high the percentage gets, they're not going to do a biopsy anyway. If somebody has a high 4K score and you do a biopsy and it's negative, then I, again, I trust pathology more than the 4K score. I mean, uh, an 8% chance is, means that 92% of them don't have Gleason 7 and above. But I'm curious if you've had that scenario. No, I, I think the, the uh, 4K score can change over time. You know, the uh, if man had a real small volume cancer and it grew, that could change uh, the, uh, you know, the biomarker levels, just like the PSA can rise. Uh, your uh, free PSA fraction or the, or the other uh, isoforms, the HK2, for example, could change uh, reflecting tumor, tumor volume. So, yeah, I think it's actually not a bad idea. You know, once your PSA is elevated, if it's seven, it's going to be elevated next year. And, and you're not going to know if a change from seven to nine, is that real? Or was that just uh, the vagaries of the assay, the vagaries of the activities the guy had the night before, or uh, some other, you know, confounder? Does it mean it was a real rise? An important aspect of the 4K score is it's not just the serum values. It also incorporates things like prior prostate biopsy and things like that. So uh, it, it could be changed just on the basis of the fact that the patient had a biopsy the previous year and it was negative. That will probably drive down the 4K score, even if all the serum values are exactly the same. Anthony, uh, can, can you elaborate uh, further on that immortal time bias? Sure. Explanation? So essentially, the punchline from these adjuvant versus salvage studies is that it appears that it's claiming that adjuvant is inferior, worse than salvage, which raises red flags. 
immediate treatment can be, you know, as good, maybe better, but shouldn't be worse than delayed treatment. And so where the immortal time bias comes into play is on the salvage arm, people could look like they did better because they were not available for assessment during the time while treatment was being delivered. That is the salvage radiation and the preparation for it, which takes a couple of months, as well as the time afterwards to assessment. So if it's a month to, to prepare it, two to deliver it, that's three months, and two or three months to assess PSA, you're looking at a four to six month window. If someone's PSA rose rapidly during that time and reached the 0.4 failure threshold, they were not being observed, they're being observed after that time, which would cause them to be scored as a failure later than the adjuvant arm, where the adjuvant arm has none of these delays, is being assessed regularly. And that's how salvage can look better than adjuvant. The immortal time bias means you're alive forever, which means that since you can't observe if somebody has failed, has died, if you will, during a period of time, they call that immortal time bias, they're not eligible for death or eligible for failure in this case. And that's the, the issue with it. So it's going to affect people who have the worst prognostic factors, the high Gleason scores, seminal vesicle invasion. And when you look at the forest plot, of these studies and you ask who has the hazard ratios greater than one where it looks like adjuvant is inferior to salvage, it's the Gleason 8 to 10 and it's the SVI, just the people you'd expect this bias to be operating in. So the punchline is we're not sure if we if adjuvant uh, versus salvage is the same in high Gleason SV invasion, invasion patients. The others probably is, but in those it's unclear. Oliver, does this uh, consideration apply to any of these crossover trials that are being done in medical oncology? No, we generally have an intent to treat analysis. So when you intend to initiate treatment at the very beginning of the study, that it, it would, <clears throat> it, it, you start calculating forward. Now, <clears throat> one of the things that there is a bias is that anytime you have a longer therapy and you start counting after the therapy is finished, which is exactly what happened in the salvage setting here, you have a bias. And so you have to be pretty careful to begin counting survival from the beginning of the randomization. If, if that had been done, Anthony, if you started counting at the time that the initial page patient underwent the adjuvant, I think you would have removed that bias because then, then you would have had failure eventually catch up and there is a period of time where failure cannot occur during the treatment period but if you remove that bias i think it, it would have turned out to be pretty similar it's an, it's an excellent point oliver it's exactly right they're looking at psa failure which is the issue if they're looking at mets or survival this goes away completely exactly. nobody's going to get out or fail in in a few months but you can psa fail in a few months if your doubling time is very short that's the issue I agree completely. Uh, Adam, one other question that I just noticed. What uh, is your preferred uh, prostate biopsy in a patient with an elevated PSA who also has end-stage renal disease? Wow. So uh, I, I, is the question asking whether they're being evaluated for a kidney transplant, uh, for a transplant, or, or is it somebody with terrible, you know, somebody has a PSA of six and, and they are a very frail individual, I'm trying not to biopsy them, period, because I don't think they're going to benefit from any sort of treatment. If if it's being evaluated for a kidney transplant, unfortunately, you're often boxed into a corner where they require you to do a biopsy before they will go ahead and transplant the patient. Uh, there is new data out there that would show that the patients don't uh, have uh, an increased risk of dying of prostate cancer, so they're not necessarily ineligible for a transplant. Uh, but you still end up doing the biopsy, and then if they have, depending on their grade and stage, you treat them like everybody else. Is that uh, transperineal, MRI targeted, uh, just the type uh, of biopsy? Uh, you know, so I, I think that the, the 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 arc is bending towards transperineal at the current time. We're still doing them transrectally. Uh, patients that have had prior ant recent antibiotic use, say within the first six, recent six months, prior prostate infection. We'll get a rectal culture on those patients uh, to make sure they're not cipro-resistant. 
And we're now double treating with Cipro and, and Ceftriaxone or Gent, depending on the, the patient. Uh, I think we're in evolution there. I don't think it's wrong to do transrectal. I don't think it's wrong to do transperineal. We'll see what happens in the next uh, few years. But I, I think the, the field is moving more towards transperineal. Anthony, back to some of your uh, considerations about who should be screened. Uh, so absent uh, uh, the uh, possibility of a renal transplant, your average man on hemodialysis for end-stage renal disease, should he be screened? I mean, this is a, Adam just talk, touched on it wonderfully in terms of comorbidity. Uh, this is somebody, you know, who's, you know, if he's not somebody who is expected to get a renal transplant, his comorbidity score is high. Uh, and so, you know, I would tend to say no. If he is somebody who, you know, has, is on a renal transplant list with hope that this will be remediated, then I would say yes. Yeah. Well, that, those are all the questions I have. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, all of the attendees. Uh, it looks like there's 96 brave souls who stayed on even past the bell here. And I particularly want to thank uh, the faculty here. Really great job. Uh, appreciate it. And uh, look forward uh, to doing it again. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jerry. Thanks as always, Jerry. Enjoyed it. Bye-bye okay. now. Bye-bye.